Welcome to SaaS Leaders Lounge, your premier podcast for cutting edge insights into the tech world. Hosted by me, Ramon. In today's special AI series episode, we're exploring the transformative power of AI with Angie Ma, the dynamic co-founder of Faculty. Angie's profound journey through the realms of academia and entrepreneurship has positioned her as a thought leader in applying AI to solve real world challenges. Angie, we're truly honored to have you here. How are you doing today and where are you calling in from? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Delighted to be here um, and sharing some of um, our experience. Um, I'm based in London and just uh, around Fulham, so it's kind of southwest of London. um, And it looks like it's a bit of an overcast day, unfortunately. Fulham, I must say, it's great to have someone from the UK on our podcast, as it's been a lot of US um, people so far and also a few Canadians, although we do love kind of a, a, a sharing that knowledge globally. But to dive straight into it, Angie, are you able to kick us off by sharing what sparked your interest in AI and what led you to founding faculty? Yes. Um, so I think my professional journey has um, taken an, a rather unconventional path. So fresh out of undergrad uh, with a degree in physics, um, this was the early 2000s, just after dot-com boom. Um, so I tried my hands doing a startup uh, with a couple of friends um, where we created a database for online shopping. Now that failed spectacularly very quickly, um, but I got a, a flavor of, uh, of startup. Um, and that point, I then found myself at a crossroad, um, uh, conflicted between, I guess, my family expectations and um, and my desires. Uh, so coming from a traditional Chinese family, I was um, encouraged to pursue a more conventional vocation like um, uh, like like law or accounting. Um, and because I was into philosophy, so I decided to give law a try, uh, which which I enjoyed um, immensely. Um, but then I quickly uh, realized that I would be a lousy lawyer and my heart wasn't in it. So I returned to physics um, because by then I knew myself better. I recognized I was uh, driven by this curiosity to really understand how the how the world works. And, yeah. uh, and I think that the turning point came a year into my PhD uh, and I serendipitously um, came across and joined this humanist community where I was introduced to AI, particularly AI safety, the safety aspect of AI. And remember, this was something like um, this was back in 2006, 2007, almost 17 Seven. years ago. But even then... Um, the technology blew me away. Um, I very remember there was one session we did was talking about how um, AI was like kind of dreaming, like as in as in how do you write algorithm to project the kind of same behaviors as as if human sort of dreaming. Um, and I was fascinated. It made me realize that AI is the transformative technology of our time. And um, that sowed the seed of a new career. And by 2013, um, uh, just more than a year ago, I concluded that academia wasn't for me. And um, although my research was intellectually stimulating, I wanted to do something um, that was more impactful and didn't require such a long time to see the result. And um, so when the opportunity came, um, to start faculty with my co-founders um, in early 2014, I um, I seized it without any hesitation. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, that's an awesome story. I must say, I guess 17 years ago, um, when you was introduced um, to, to kind of AI safety in your PhD, that's a strong experience that basically shaped your perspective on AI and also kind of was a start in a motivation to establishing faculty down the line. I've been looking at the growth of faculty. It's been great that you saw the future, basically, by having such an idea um, so far back. But in terms of your recent collaboration with OpenAI, it's definitely creating quite a buzz. Are you able to elaborate on this venture and also the implications for you? Yeah. Um, 
Yes, actually, it is true. You mentioned that AI safety is very much sort of in our DNA. That's that's how it got me into AI, and um, and and with the a um, partnership with uh, OpenAI. Um, so as I said, um, AI I think is the most important technology of uh, certainly of our time and definitely for the next decade, and every organization will try to transform itself with AI. Um, but, you know, many will fail, some will succeed, you know, how these things are actually very challenging. And to succeed, you actually requires getting a number of things right. And I think um, in, in the way we think about it is how, you know, our approach to AI is to a safe, impactful and human first AI. And I think together with our, I guess, 10 years of experience of um, implementing um, AI systems. Um, certainly, I think OpenAI trusts that we would be the people who could deliver value um, as, a, as a technical partner, as well as um, ensuring the robustness and um, safety of these systems. No, thank you so much. I think that's groundbreaking and thrilling to see how your collaboration could redefine AI applications, especially in regards to the safety element, which we'll touch later in an ethics question coming towards yourself. But yeah, I'm pushing the boundaries of what's possible, it seems like you're continuously doing. And your recent insights on the AI, sorry, I wasn't sure if you was going to say something there, Angie. No, no. Continue, please. Oh, apologies. <laughs> Brilliant. So your recent insights on AI in the energy sector, especially regarding sustainability, are invaluable. Are you able to delve into how faculty is innovating within this area? Yeah. Um, sustainability, the environment is obviously a very critical topic um, for, yeah. for, for the entire world. Um, so we have um, a business unit um, that's dedicated to to the energy transition and environment. And not surprisingly, the business unit is called energy transition and environment. <laughs> um, I think there are three areas um, in the energy sector that um, in this transition that AI could add a lot of value. So first is in the um, asset performance. So using AI to enhance the asset base and increase the operating margin, for example. So an example would, uh, of this uh, would be um, we partnered with a startup to develop remote pressure control capabilities um, for one of the largest gas um, distribution company in the UK. Um, so it, you can imagine like you want to be able to monitor and to um, to control um, and maintain these gas pressure along the the, the distribution network. And yeah. this solution helps reduce, for example, methane leakages um, and also improve um, maintenance activities because you're able to like monitor it well and 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 um, uh, uh, schedule maintenance activities, for example, and that really sort of prepare well the the organization to for later injection of renewable, for example. And this yeah. improvement of asset performance and and better maintenance on well, in this case, critical national infrastructure, um, helps like reduce costs for consumers and also like just get our grid better prepared for decarbonization or decarbonizing the grid. So that's that's the first aspect. Second aspect is um, is how improving kind of the, the process efficiency. So using AI to yeah. optimize um, organizational processes and, and improving customer experience. So for example, um, we worked with a local um, distribution network to you know predict their load so the 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 kind of the amount of electricity that you could carry in a network more accurately that means it enables them to for example procure energy uh uh for you know more flexibility and plan their network um more effectively for the longer term 
And the third um, aspect is um, uh, energy system transition. So working in partnership with organization to really sort of think and, and develop energy system for the future. So for example, like this is actually a really cool um, company that we worked with, a startup um, called Drift. Yeah. Um, and they make hydrogen generating uh, boat. So basically you can generate um, electricity and store it as hydrogen by um, by wind, for example. And wow. in fact, you should check it out. It's beautiful boats <laughs> that are like very like kind of future looking and very sleek and, and they go out into sea and travel and they basically bring back electricity. And we help make their concept uh, a reality with them um, routing um, uh, system to help you know the boats to find the most favorable favorable wind so you know you want to collect the most amount of electricity energy back whilst having this like the shortest route back and not wasting your energy and that that gives like like 70 i think is 72 73 percent of efficiency twice as effective as producing electricity compared to offshore wind and in fact it's like the first boat in the world that produce hydrogen at sea using just wind so it's really cool you know like there's you know there are innovations you could still do um in in the energy kind of generation aspect so three um asset performance process efficiency and um and innovation in uh, energy uh, system transition Solution. No, that's um, enlightening to say the least. I think I'm just touching back with the remote um, pressure control facilities, being able to monitor and also kind of control guest pressure. Um, it does the right thing in the world. Things like less leakage, I think it's critical, as you said, to our, our national infrastructure, if I relay the exact words. And then you're going on to the efficiency, not just a lower cost, but also a higher quality, as you've mentioned, and then kind of the innovativeness of definitely be checking out that hydrogen and um, energy transmission boat. I think it's um, something that shows you're fostering a greener um, future as well as a kind of an amazing future as well that's moving towards kind of this AI um, infusion, infusion that everyone's um, fanatical about. But an important yeah. consideration, I think um, you're doing, you're promoting the right thing in terms of safety. They say it's, we're not going to be replaced by AI, it's the person utilising AI. And I strongly think that also um, has a relation to ethics. But if we um, move into this question where ethics are increasingly scrutinised, how does faculty, faculty ensure its AI developments are both responsible and also beneficial? Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, like, um, AI safety is, like, in our DNA. Um, and yeah. in fact, we, we started our AI safety lab back in 2016, focusing on um, safe um, implementation of AI in a, a commercial setting. Um, so as I said earlier, we have our approach to AI safe, impactful and yes. human first. And I think all three actually actually lends to um, uh, safe and, and responsible AI. And I'll go into just a very brief details in, in each of them. Um, so I think human first, I think it's really, really important because you have to really, so AI very much software system, you have to really sort of think about designing the AI system such that people can trust and work effectively with AI. And so it means it needs to have the right level of performance, the right level of interpretability so can you understand a system so a human can govern it yeah. um, the safety aspect um, uh, is it robust does it respect um, privacy for example and governance um, for the particular application so all this I mean, that's what we sort of say as human first an AI system all has to like basically fulfill those requirements um yeah. the other aspect is um is how to ensure that it's um connected now one of the challenge we see currently in the market is that you will, you might have a lot of ai um uh, uh systems that's 
build that doesn't necessarily connect directly into the business processes. So this, in one aspect, doesn't provide value. The other is that it creates silo that it makes it very difficult to govern. So you, you, um, some of your listeners here might be familiar with like shadow AI, for example, a shadow IT, which is IT system that isn't like managed or um, uh, or monitored by the, the the organization. So now you could see um, a lot of organizations saying that, gosh, they have so many AI initiatives going on, like some hundreds, and they have no way of um, of monitoring them um, and to put like governance, the right policy around it. So having yeah. these connected system and like making sure that you have like good governance policies that you could um, implement it and, and actually lay on top of each of the system is is um, very important. And I think the last point is actually um, often people think, you know, doing safety is like making system worse. But actually, from what we see, doing it in a safe um, and connected way it actually makes a better performance, actually better like outcome for the organizations because you are able to um, minimize mitigating risk whilst harnessing the benefit of AI. I agree with yourself. Um, I think it's commendable and how you've laid out that faculty is not just pioneering AI technology, but also kind of setting the standards um, in regards to having the right level performance already within the AI so a person can actually govern it and then um, installing that governance as well. Um, looking ahead to the future, what emerging AI breakthrough excites you the most and how is faculty gearing up to embrace this advancement? Um, so I think uh, the, the field of AI is moving at you know, light year speed, basically, it's very far. So I will yeah. make a fool of myself if I'm predicting, you know, the next technology, because it's so unpredictable. Uh, <laughs> but what I think is the real kind of um, future is, um, is how to really harness the benefits of AI whilst mitigating the, mitigating the risk. So what I mean by that is, um, Generative AI, um, especially in the last year, has really sort of brought AI into the mainstream. Now, businesses are, you know, in some way rushing to implement AI tools, which is exciting. Um, but yeah. there is a risk to that it gets um, people get caught up in the hype cycle. So, is this um, seeking short term gains over over uh, transformational investment? Um, yeah. And I think. Our observation um, is that current approaches to AI adoption, um, as I said, are, are somewhat the, the system are disconnected to the business processes. For example, um, it it are they are could be siloed and entrenched. So actually, getting value is hard, and um, we also find that you know that the tools, as I say, um, are not well governed. So the risks. Like biases are missed, so I actually see think the future is that actually a lot of these challenges need to be overcome, so that then businesses are really getting like value out of AI, pushing the the field and 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 industry forward, um, and also um, with you know regulations and standards inevitable coming in you know, how do you ensure good governance compliances to allow, you know, businesses to continue to, 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 you know, make use of this, this incredible technology. So I think that's, you know, I'm sort of got myself mm -hmm. a get my get, get out of jail card is, is that I think it's more about how to do like AI adoption well, um, in, in the, in the future, in the next couple of years. Brilliant. No, I love the answer. I must say, I think everybody, as you've said, is caught up in the hype at the moment. Um, not to say it would get worse before it gets better, but I think, um, yeah, maybe more difficult before it gets better um, in that way. But um, more, to move to a more lighthearted, um, quickfire oh. section, it would be great to <laughs> let our audience discover more about the person behind innovation, Nanji. Um, so are you ready for... Our... 
<laughs> Brilliant. I haven't got too much of difficult questions, but um, it should be a lot of fun for us. So to dive into it, um, I'm a musical person at heart. Um, do you prefer classic musical or more pop uh, music, if either? Oh, I love classical and jazz. I also like pop. In fact, I think I like all. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's a bit like me as well, to be honest. Um, are you more of a reader or a writer? I'm definitely a reader. I love reading books, um, but I like to write more. Okay, <laughs> that's brilliant to know as well. Um, are you into more speaking or listening? I'm definitely um, more into listening because I, especially listening to people, I find hearing people's stories super interesting um, and fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, especially when you're on the train or something like that, I tend to uh, take out the headphones <laughs> just to yep. eavesdrop, as they say. Um, are you more of a coder or a designer? Oh, I used to code, but I haven't really done much coding. So, in fact, you know, people don't allow me to go anywhere near coding uh, anymore. <laughs> so, um, I would say designer uh, then because I, I think, um, yeah, I, I love design, especially good design where it really sort of delights the users and you have great user experience. So designers, yes. Brilliant. I think this, uh, your answer might tie into the next question, but are you more of a planner or are you more into improvising? Oh, uh so I, I would say um, I'm quite square as a person. So I would say I'm, I'm quite <laughs> like to plan in that sense. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to be more fun and, and improvising more. <laughs> <laughs> you could always have fun planning, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> when we go on our family holidays nowadays, uh, my partner, she loves to know every single where we're going on every single day. And to be honest, um, it does bring a lot of structure and we have amazing fun. So I think, yeah, it could definitely link to fun being a planner more than I'm taking a risk improvising. But um, we've got three more short questions left. So are you more of a swimmer or more of a sunbather? Oh, um, swimmer, um, because I... I guess sunburn really easily and I, I I I always if if possible get to do a bit more exercise so swimmer. Yeah, yeah brilliant answer I must say. Um ice cream or yogurt? Oh gosh, so I love love ice cream but <laughs> uh but I try to uh watch out for you know healthier and so yogurt uh is so in my heart, I want to go for the ice cream. But in reality, <laughs> you try to discipline and go for the yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I love the answer, definitely. And last question. Um, if either, are you more into reality TV or documentaries? Oh, um, so I don't watch TV much. Um, but if I do, I think documentary especially i love um those on kind of uh david attenborough like uh, planet earth um i just find it incredible just every time yeah. i watch them I'm like wow in awe so i would say documentaries then brilliant no i love the answers why well, i tend to watch david attenborough with my daughter instead of letting her watch <laughs> too much animation so yeah i sit there and enjoy it more than her i think yeah. <laughs> brilliant but to keep the collaborative nature we have on SAS Leaders Lounge also, um, we always answer a question from our previous guests um, to the present, and also you would have an opportunity to ask a question to our following guests. So previously we had Gary Brockman, he's the CEO of a company called Secamine, and they're basically machine learning for a sustainable automotive engineering. But his question was more towards, um, I believe, uh, 10 years ago or more so when you started up the organization, in fostering a culture of innovation, how do you encourage um, embracing failure within faculty? Mm. Um, that's a great question, I think. Um, I think from our experience, so we... I'm trying to think our journey because we grew from, you know, just a few of us to now over 400 people. And 
Um, how do you still make sure there is, um, you know, part of the, the aspects of innovation is to be um, to doing a lot of uh, experiments, iterations, and 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 embracing failure. So, um, so I think, especially I think you know, at a, for the largest size scale organizations, I think it has to be culture. It's like how do you uh, build and nurture a culture that um, that drives innovation. So a couple of our values, um, which then you know obviously feeds into our culture, I think helps with that. Like one value we have is um, is seeking truth. Is how you know how do you um, you know use your best effort to understand. Um, kind of objective truth um, and you have to be collaborative you have to be humble you have to be um, open to new ideas for example and so um, so that aspect means that you you have to um, kind of keep seeking what's the kind of like um, uh, the 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 understanding something really well and 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 trying yeah. Now, then the other aspect, um, another value is, for example, um, is maximize uh, impact. Then, you know, because you also, you know, innovation requires that you really trying, but whilst, you know, be quite pragmatic at the same time. And so yeah. this kind of maximize impact is really sort of thinking, okay, well, um, am I, um, am I, have I got to the right kind of like, uh, answer for the right kind of purpose and then um and then you know and then be very pragmatic about it so i don't think i have great answers for it other than you know it's important to culture and i'm sure like pretty much everywhere you have principles and values that um will uh will actually be quite um you know uh, useful and important for driving innovations like how do you then elevate yeah. them and nurture them so that you 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 you, you cultivate a, a culture the right culture for that brilliant no i love the answer i must say i guess i'm um, setting the right culture from the start if you are a startup is incredibly important to as you mentioned allowing them your employees to search for the truth and then also the maximization within that aggressive and a pro pragmatic approach so yeah putting it all together it's a wonderful answer <laughs> i must say angie and if <laughs> gary or any other startups um, on our uh, podcast want to learn more information i hope you don't mind me pointing them in your direction due to the success you've had growing to a 400 size organization still innovating but um, <laughs> for our next guest angie and um, we've got the founder and also ceo of an organization called deep search labs um a lady called Miriam. Fayez Toshizi. Um, Deep Search Labs, they're basically a specialized intelligent search engine for the industry. And what would your question be for Miriam on our next podcast session? Um, well, I think what they're doing is super cool. Um, I definitely would like to find out more. And whenever I speak to other organizations, I'm always interested to hear what their observation and advice in, cool. in kind of driving AI adoption, you know, what are the challenges they see and, you know, how they kind of see to, to make sure that organizations are successful in, in adopting AI. So, um, so yeah, I'll be interested to see from, you know, from her experience, uh, what, what their observation and learnings or advice is. Brilliant. I'm also very interested in learning about that as well, and I'm sure our listeners will be. So thank you very much for that great question. Before we wrap up, Angie, are you able to share where our listeners can find more about you, your impactful work at faculty, and also any upcoming projects or talks? Yeah, so we have, um, you can find us on our website, uh, faculty.ai. And there are lots of um, case studies, blog posts. Um, we basically keep it pretty up to date about different activities we're doing. And um, and for me, you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn um, or even just my email, which is angie at faculty.ai. And yeah, I would I, I really actually love to hear about 
um, your organizations and your challenges, especially related to AI adoption. Brilliant. Um, that's excellent. I'm going to pinpoint all the details you just uh, Apple and Spotify and playlist. But again, thank you so much, Angie, for joining us on the Sets Leaders Lounge podcast and sharing your valuable insights into AI's transformative journey. It's been a thought provoking and also enlightening conversation overall. Um, to our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Stay subscribed to the SaaS Leaders Lounge on your favorite podcast platform to catch more enlightening episodes from pioneers just like Angie. Until next time, keep innovating, pushing the boundaries in the world of SaaS and farewell. Thank you so much for your time again, Angie. Take care. Thank you.